true crime is a huge part of pop culture, with a larger interest in cultural awareness around true crime cases and unsolved mysteries. Investigators and filmmakers are taking advantage of this new medium to help spread awareness and hopefully solve these cases. From high-profile cases to the lesser known, here are five true crime documentaries that you need to watch. Number 5 On June 13, 1994, 13-year-old Nicholas Barclay went missing from San Antonio, Texas. He was out playing basketball with his friends and had asked his mom to pick him up. She was asleep, so instead, he asked his older brother, but he refused and put down the phone on him. This is the last time that Nicholas was ever seen, at least the real Nicholas. Hours passed and Nicholas still hadn't arrived home. This wasn't unusual behavior as Nicholas often ran away from home, but usually wasn't gone for longer than a day. When two days had passed, his family were worried and called police to report him missing. In the police's opinion, Nicholas had simply run away like he'd done many times before and he would be back soon. To add to the theory that he ran away, he was due to be sentenced for breaking into a shop, stealing shoes, and threatening a teacher. This trial was due to take place on June 14th the day after he went missing, and would have most likely seen him placed in a group home, which Nicholas hated the idea of. The next mention of Nicholas comes on September 25, 1994, when his older brother called the police and told them that he'd seen Nicholas trying to break into the garage. It's believed that this is either a case of mistaken identity, or an attempt by his older brother to make the police believe that he was still alive and in the area. The documentary, The Imposter, follows the tragic story of Nicholas Barclay and his family's fight to find their missing son. In October of 1997, the family finally had a spark of hope when a young man came forward from Spain and claimed to be Nicholas. The trouble was that Nicholas had blonde hair and blue eyes and was 13 at the time of his disappearance, making him 16 in 1997. The boy who had come forward claiming to be Nicholas had bleached hair, brown eyes, and spoke with a French accent. The imposter explained that he had an accent due to living in Europe for three years and that his eye color had been changed by his abductors. He claimed that he'd been kidnapped and sold into sexual slavery. The documentary The Imposter also follows the story of Nicholas's family as they welcome back the boy found in Spain with open arms. The main aim of the documentary is to examine how and why the family were so willing to accept the imposter without questioning the very obvious differences between the two. Were Nicholas's family so desperate to find their son that they believed that the imposter was their son? The imposter was found to be 23-year-old Frederick Borden after fingerprints were matched using the Interpol database. Despite the glaringly obvious fact that this imposter wasn't their son, the Barclay family welcomed him in with open arms and did their best to assimilate him with his family. Frederick Borden had a large history of impersonating missing children to gain sympathy and a steady, loving home. The documentary features interviews with Frederick explaining how he was able to deceive Spanish and American authorities. Throughout the documentary, Frederick shows little remorse or empathy for the Barclay family. It seems that given the chance, he would do this again. He was sentenced to six years for impersonating Nicholas and passport fraud. Throughout the documentary, the whole Barclay family displayed odd behavior that many viewers have commented on. His mother seems to show little to no emotion, and she refused to give a blood sample and seemed to welcome someone who clearly wasn't her son back into her life. Many people have pointed to the fact that his mother may be involved with the disappearance of Nicholas. The only words that his older brother uttered to him were good luck, indicating that he knew there was an imposter or possibly hinting to someone knowing more about the disappearance of Nicholas, or that he was dead. The documentary is a whirlwind of information and it will leave you scratching your head. Do his family know more about his disappearance than they're letting on? It's a must-watch documentary for any true crime fan and it will be interesting to see what conclusions you take from it. As of 2020, Nicholas Barclay is still missing. He's described as a white male with sandy blonde or light brown hair and blue eyes. He would be 39 years old at the time of writing this. He has a tattoo of J on his left shoulder and a letter T on his left hand between his thumb and his first finger, and the letters L and N on his left outside ankle. 
If you have any information about the disappearance of Nicholas Barclay, you're urged to contact the San Antonio Police Department at 210-207-7484. Number 4 Natasha Kampusch was just 10 years old when she was kidnapped from Vienna, Austria. On the morning of March 2, 1998, Natasha left her home and walked to school. She was excited as this was the first time her mother had ever let her go alone. On her walk, she passed a man who appeared to be making deliveries from his van. When she walked closer to him, he'd snatched her off the streets and threw her into his van. This would be the start of a 3,096-day ordeal for Natasha. The film titled 3,096 Days follows a reconstruction of how her abductor, 44-year-old Wolfgang Preclobiel, kidnapped her from the street and took her back to a purpose-built underground bunker. For eight years, he imprisoned and abused Natasha. She was beaten and starved by Wolfgang as he attempted to make her fall in love with him. While this is a film and not a documentary, the film is based heavily around the testimony of Natasha and uses police reports and other information to create a fully faceted view of the horror that she experienced. In an SMH article written in 2013, shortly after the film's released, Natasha said, I never screamed down there. My body was unable to scream. It was a silent scream. In this quote, she's referring to the six foot by six foot basement where she was kept. She was told that the windows and doors were booby-trapped and that her family had forgotten about her and that no one was looking for her. Natasha Kampusch managed to flee the basement in August of 2006 to alert authorities and find her family. While Natasha is free, there's little justice for the youth she lost. Wolfgang commits suicide the night that she escaped and Natasha has been living with the deep psychological scars ever since. The film 3096 Days does an incredible job of portraying a story that may have been too painful to create as a documentary. While Natasha has written a book about her ordeal, she's been very closed off from the world. Even her father doesn't think she's told her family the full story of what happened to her. 3096 Days comes with a heavy disclaimer, as the subjects covered in the film won't be suitable for some audiences. Number 3 Abducted in Plain Sight has to be one of the most insane true crime documentaries to ever grace our screens. Before Tiger King and Don't Mess With Cats came this. The documentary follows the story of 12-year-old Jan Broberg, who was kidnapped by a family friend in the 1970s. While this is not an uncommon story heard in the true crime world, the fact that her family knew exactly what was going on makes this story all the more unbelievable. Family friend Robert Birchtold told her family that he was taking her horse riding, but instead he kidnapped her and took her down to Mexico. Her family didn't want to report the crime as they were too scared of upsetting the Birchtolds and didn't want to ruin the relationship they had with them. It seemed that relationship was more important than their own daughter. As Jan grew up, she was slowly being groomed by Robert right under the nose of her family, as the Broberg family were involved in the Church of the Latter-day Saints, so it was important for them to keep their reputation in their small Idaho community. The story is told by the Broberg family, with the use of court transcripts, which offer a tiny bit of clarity into this insane story. The whole family, including 12-year-old Jan, were brainwashed into thinking that the grooming and assault were okay, and that if she told anyone, her dad would die and harm would come to her family. Jan had become so scared and brainwashed by Robert that she insisted to authorities that he hadn't assaulted her, despite what a medical examination showed. Robert took Jan to Mexico so the pair could get married, as the age of consent was just 12 years old in 1974. Whereas in their native Idaho, it would have still been illegal. Not to get too far away from the documentary, from start to finish, it's an incredible whirlwind of WTF moments. After Jan was brought back to safety, her family told investigating authorities that she hadn't been taken against her will, and that they seemingly consented to Robert taking her away to Mexico to marry her, all to keep a dirty little secret safe. If you haven't already seen this documentary, it's a must-watch and you'll find out what secrets the Broberg family were willing to keep hidden in exchange for allowing this to happen to their young daughter. Number 2 
This documentary comes with a heavy disclaimer. The topics discussed in this documentary cover child abuse and neglect and will not be suitable for all audiences, so viewer discretion is advised. The trials of Gabriel Fernandez captivated audiences all around the world when it launched on Netflix on January 26, 2020. While Netflix documentaries are often well received, the subject matter paired with the fact that most of the world was in pre-lockdown measures due to COVID-19 meant that this documentary became very popular with those shielding at home. The documentary is one of the most harrowing and heartbreaking that has ever been made. The topic of child abuse is never an easy one to cover, but it's an important topic to highlight as it happens every day worldwide. In 2013, Gabriel Fernandez was 8 years old and living with his mother, Pearl, and her boyfriend, Isuaro. Gabriel's horrific ordeal is shown over 6 episodes, with each episode diving deeper into the case. It follows the life and death of the happy, smiling little boy, along with the horrific abuse he suffered at the hands of his mother and her boyfriend. One clip that is hard to watch is a part where the teacher is talking about what he was like at school. She explains, that for the upcoming Mother's Day, she asked the children to stand up with some letters spelling out M-O-M and then pose for a picture to give as a present. Gabriel can be seen with bruises and cuts on his face along with a very swollen black eye. His hair had crudely been shaved off and his arms were covered in what looked like cuts and burns. Despite all these injuries that he suffered at the hands of his mother, he stood happily and posed with a smile for the Mother's Day card. Despite everything she'd put him through, Gabriel still adored his mother and that's the hardest part to comprehend. Testimony from those closest to Gabriel in the documentary detail how he was forced to eat cat litter and forced to sleep in a tiny cabinet in his mother's room, all while his brothers and sisters were unharmed. Despite the best efforts of his teachers, Gabriel's case was ignored by social services, and just a few days after he took those Mother's Day photos, he passed away. The creator and director of the documentary, Brian Knappenberger told Entertainment Weekly in an article titled The Trials of Gabriel Fernandez, director explains why the documentary had to be difficult to watch, written on February 26th of 2020. The documentary is really difficult to watch because it's an important one. We made the decision that Gabriel's voice needed to be heard, and in order to tell that story, we had to be as honest and straightforward as we possibly could. I think in the end, this is a story of a kind of redemption, or questions of how things can be better in the system, and that has motivated us to tell the story. If you know of a child or a vulnerable adult you believe may be being abused, it's important to speak up and contact the local social services or hotlines because you may just save a life. Number 1 Don't F With Cats is one of the craziest and most popular true crime documentaries released in 2020, second only to Tiger King. The documentary follows Deanna Thompson and John Green on their hunt to find a man who was posting animal torture videos online. Their main concern was stopping the mysterious man in his tracks and stopping him before his violence escalated to humans. I don't want to give too much away, but what they discovered will blow your mind. The angle of the documentary is from the perspective of Deanna and John as they delve deeper and deeper into the mystery. They even created a Facebook group called, you guessed it, Don't F With Cats, where internet sleuths all banded together to hunt down the sick monster. The level of detail and investigation done by both Deanna and John, along with the Facebook group, cannot be understated. Luca began taunting them online and becoming all the more elusive as to his identity. He was playing a game of cat and mouse. Don't F With Cats follows the story of Luca Magnota, from his crimes against the animals all the way to the depraved crime he committed against a 33-year-old student, Lin Zhu. The documentary is incredibly graphic in its detail, and clips of Magnota's depraved acts are partially shown. This documentary is not for the faint of heart and comes with a heavy disclaimer. At one point, Luca even claimed to be in a relationship with a Canadian serial killer, Carla Hamolka, to further his public image. Luca killed for one reason, infamy. He wanted to be known and feared by all. If you haven't already watched Don't F With Cats, then this is a documentary series that we highly recommend. The story takes place over four episodes, with the last two episodes not containing any videos of the abuse. If you're not already an amateur sleuth, this documentary will certainly pique your interest and get you started into digging into the dark side of the internet.
Thank you guys so much for watching. If you like this video, be sure to click that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But I've been Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.